started. So in the previous couple of sessions here, we have had a lot of um, theory about how you do profiling. And now I will show you a bit of practice. I'll show you the tools that are involved in doing the profiling work. So a bit about me. I'm a FIRE consultant with Fiore. I've been working with FIRE for a while now. I started getting familiar with FIRE from my previous organization back in Australia. I ran tracks at the Australian National Connect accounts previously. I developed the front end for the FIRE industry that you've seen here. Now, the way this session is going to work is I'll give you a an overview of all the toolkit that I use as a fire profiler when I'm working on projects. I won't go into too much detail because it's kind of boring, it's more interesting to do it hands on. But you will get a sense of what are you supposed to do when you start going and doing those exercises. And if you have any questions, of course, feel free to ask me during the session. I'm happy to go more in depth into any particular areas that people are interested in. I will also give notable mentions of other tools that are available out there since I'll be discovering ones that I'm intimately familiar with, and we'll do a session at the end. So, in general, when making IG, you make your profiles, your constraints, your make your terminology resources, you specify the codes and etc. that you use, then you make your IG, which is the actual publication, PDF or HTML, whatever it be, where you bring it all together. And then you validate all of your work, you validate that your resources are valid, etc. To make profiles, you use Ferrari. My colleague Michelle Rudin, who was just in here just before that, he makes that too. So I'll go over to Forge and show you how to do a couple of things. But before you go off and making your own stuff, be very sure to reuse anything you can. There is a whole lot of resources available in Firefly. First of all, is the file registry. If you need to make a new profile or an extension, check if it already is, if it exists already. If it already exists and it already fits your use case, adapt it. If it doesn't quite meet your use case, get in touch with offers, see if you can expand the use case. It is always better to build reusable systems. It is very important to build reusable systems early on now before everybody comes up with their own silos and then when they need to do the bigger things, they're like, oh, so, this is the very important time to be thinking about reusability. You can check a fire extension, you can check a fire registry for it, you can check a fire extensions list. Fire spec has a list published on the specification of all these resources that are available. And you can also check Simplify, where people can, people can upload their own profiles and extensions. Now, Let's get into the tooling. Forge. How do I do the cardinality? Let's do a very basic use case just to see how Forge looks like. So, this is Forge. There's a welcome menu over here. And here you can click on make a new profile, make a new derived profile. The derived profile is simply a profile that builds upon an existing profile that's available already. You can create a new extension, or a logical model, or a implementation guide resource. We'll create a new profile. Now, we've got a new profile. We have a whole list of profiles here. There is an entire file specification. Or we can also profile that type. But we'll go for profile for now. Now you see how we have a patient and we have numbers by every single profile. This number is the maturity level profile. It goes from 0 to 5. 4 to 5 are pretty stable. 0 is very draft. Anything can change. So 4 shows it right here for you to see. You know what you're getting into right for that. Let's go 5. Profile which is patient, which is very stable. We select it, Forge will load it up. It'll display the entire profile in one go, the entire resource in one go, which is, as you see, will mimic, will actually show the exact same data as the fire specification has. And it's shown in the same order, so it's very familiar to look at. When you select a particular element 
on the right side, it shows details about the specific element. When we go and uh, we can change the cardinality, we can change a whole lot of properties about that element right here. As you can see, there's a lot of things that you can do with every particular element. Now, with a name, you see how the cardinality is right now zero to many. So we can either have no names, we can have one name, we can have 5,000 names. For example's sake, let's try constraining it. Let's try changing it zero to one. Now you see how it got changed, and there is a pen symbol on the cardinality, on the element, on the name, and on the resource itself. So Forge is showing us exactly what changed down to the cardinality level. We can save our resource, use our dialog, and save. Now, we can also reset it back, and you see all the pen, all the pen markers go away. This means that our resource is now unmodified. It's back to the original. That way you can test, that way you can see what things can be changed from the original because of the pen symbols that appear everywhere. Now you see how the active element, its cardinality, is 0 to 1 right now. If we try and change, if we try and break it by making it 0 to many, which is illegal in FHIR, in FHIR you can only constrain down, so what most we can do is 0 to 0, you can suddenly make an element have more copies of it than systems will allow, because they'll just break things. If we try and change it to 0 to many, we do that, and you see there is a warning symbol everywhere. Just like the pen, it goes down to the very individual element, which is incorrect, which is the cardinality, and it shows us at the bottom that the maximum cardinality is greater than what's allowed one. Cardinality may only be further restricted. So Forge does real-time validation for you against the fire scheme as well. So if you start breaking things, it lets you know, which is super handy. So, that's a general, well, very quick overview of how to use Forge. Next are the main sort of, uh, main parts of a Forge user interface that are available in here. Let's go over that. So, at first you have the Session Explorer. Here you will have all your open profiles. And every file will have specific file information about it. At the bottom, we will see validation information. Any informational messages, any incorrect organalities, or any other errors will appear there at the bottom. Next, you have the element properties, which change as you select different elements. And on top, we have different views into our resource. So right now, we're looking at the element tree. There's other views that we can look at as well. For example, if we go to properties, these, these are the general metadata properties about our profile. So it has things like the description of the profile, the version of the profile, the publishing date of the profile, the size of the status, etc. All of the metadata is in the first tab. include things like identifiers, resources, etc. Next is the narrative. The narrative is still useful in a profile in case you have a system that cannot render all the structure information in it. Filling in the narrative and giving a bit of information about what this profile is about will give it at least some free text to the system that it can display in lieu of actual structure information. Element tree is something we've already looked at. Displays all the elements. And then there's an element grid, which, if you prefer this view, is a spreadsheet like view into your entire resource, all in a table like format. And after that, we also have 
the XML view, which is the last tab. So if you click on that, you can see all of the XML. There's all the shopper when you can see it. That our resource looks like so far. The other thing you can do in Forge is some elements have a choice of types. And you could, of course, be interested in, in constraining that choice to be something else. So, for example, with disease element in patient, can I would be a Boolean, so patient's disease, yes or no, or a daytime instead. So, if we in our profile, for example, want to restrict it to be a Boolean only, we can untick the daytime and now it becomes disease Boolean. And you can see how the element name also changes to be disease Boolean. So, fire specification, that's how it should be called then. So, if you're sending stuff over the wire, the field, the element name will be disease Boolean. You can also change the value sets. So, for example, the language element is by default bound to the H7 languages value set, but as you can see here, the strength is extensible, which means that we can add our own codes to that value set if we need to. To do that, we create a new value set, and I'll show you how to create value sets next with another tool. But after we've created a new value set, we can go back to Forge and we can swap out this value set with another value set that is a superset of this one. It has to have all the original codes because this simply says it is extensible, so we have to have all the original codes, but we can add more codes on top to create a superset. So to swap out the reference, you just type in the new value set reference here in Forge. And that'll be it. And then which codes. And last but not least, let's say you work on your profile for a fair while and you are interested in publishing it somewhere. Right now it's on your computer. So we can publish it to simplify it. Now, let's have a look at how we do that. So first of all, you see how Forge says the canonical resource URL of structure definition slash my patient is unsuitable for publishing purposes. It's not unique at all. We need to give it a unique canonical URL, that nice looking baby Michelle was talking about earlier. To do that, we go to property tab. This is the URL, this is canonical URL. So we fill in our own canonical URI, essentially, to identify our profile uniquely whenever, wherever it's published on any server. So let's give it some name. Fill in the resource name as well. And uh, fill in the description. Just a quick overview of what this profile is about. Then we go and we fill in the purpose. The purpose is very, very essential to fill in because when you come back to this profile five years on and you see that Fire is already doing what you want this profile to do, then you'll be wondering, why did I create this profile to begin with? So that field, I find, is very, very important to fill in. And then you go to a file menu and you go to publish simplify.net right here. You can select simplify.net as the publishing server. Log in as you do. And once we log in, we can select a project. There's no projects available yet. So, what you do is you go to simplify.net, right here. You go to your avatar, you go to your portal, and then you click on create project. So, you can create a project right here. You create a project, you give it a description. As a test project, you select the test scope and you hit create. So now when we go back to Forge, it doesn't refresh, we cancel, go to the publishing menu again, go to simplify.net, 
log in, I'll remember a password. And this time around, let's see a project that we just created. Go to my demo project. We're ready to publish. Wait, save. And Forge will upload our profile of the simplifier. After it's published, you refresh this project page. Bam, on profiles. You go to the resources tab, you click on that, and you see, right here's my patient. That's how I got published. Pretty quick. And here is our new patient. You see that everything's grayed out because we didn't change it, except active is with a normal black text, which means we've changed it. And here we can see exactly what we changed. We changed the minimum cardinality. It used to be 0 to 1, now it's 1 to 1. It's pretty clear from this reason. Name, we made it be 1 to 1. Disease Boolean, cardinality stayed the same, but we made it be disease Boolean instead of disease choice, which was disease daytime Boolean. So that's how you can see this rendering here right here. To learn more of uh, the reports we put together on simplify.net. It is free, make an account, it's free to make an account. You go and look at everything, and we have a whole lot of modules over on how to do this yourself. It's about a five day course all in all, you can do it at your own pace. Now, we skipped making terminology in Forge. To make terminology, you can use this very handy tool called Snapper Offer. It's created by the CSRO from Australia. Let's have a look at that. We can make code systems, we can make value sets, and other things with it. So, you can find existing fire resources, or you can find code systems, value sets, or concept maps with Snapper. We will be making a new code system. So, first of all, give it a new name, my awesome code system. <laughs> We're hit done, and this is the general overview. You see where you have, you can give it a name, you can give it the URI, give it a value set URI if we want to embed a value set in the process right away, and in general case, the solidity of our codes. To fill in code is pretty easy, it's a spreadsheet like format, so you can give it a code, you can give it a display name, you can give it a definition right here. It's super easy to do. So we'll fill in some sample codes right here. Then we can go to additional metadata tab. We can select like, the identifier of this. We can select which version of our code system it is. We can set the publication data and when this code system is published. And finally, we can go to upload to the file tab and where we can see in JSON format our code system. You see all of our codes are represented here pretty nicely. And we can download the code system and it'll give us a JSON file. We can also click on validate. And if we validate it, we still see that we screwed up. We forgot the canonical URL. And it'll tell us right here. So, similar to Forge, Snapper also offers validation. So, go to Advanced Terms, Code System URI, we'll fill in some example URI. Go to upload again, we do a validation. It'll validate our content, and this time it's happy, no complaints. Next, let's do value sets. Once we we'll create our code systems, of course we want to create our value sets, because that is how you actually use codes in file. So to create a value set, go to new value set again, create a similar menu, we're done. We've learned from our mistake, so we'll fill in the canonical URL right away this time. And we can start entering codes just like we did for the code system before. But that's pretty boring. See, there's a very handy tab right at the bottom right here. You can import codes from CSV file. This is super handy. So you have something like 300 Norwegian codes. With letters that my keyboard doesn't have, this is what you do. You import them, you select your tab separated codes, you select which format it is, tab separated. First of all, you can select how many rows for the header, 
So if you have a special header that's describing all your columns, you can say skip one row, essentially. And you select which column is my codes, and you can select which column is my display uh, info line code. And then we can hit import, and magic happens. All of these codes are in here, super fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, makes me very happy. There's over 300 codes I didn't have to enter. No manual data entry mistakes. It's one happy model right here. And you can see all those codes are in our value set. Again, we can either download value set, or we can also do download expanded value set. Now, that is a very interesting option. What does that mean? It means that this tool supports using filters. If you have something like SNOMED, you can set the filter. I would like my code system to be uh, subchildren of all of the particular codes, like all, all codes that are soon as code. You just give it that expression, and that's it. And then you do download expanded value set, and it'll actually blow it up for me, and I'll enumerate all the codes that I've selected using my filter. So this tool is backed by a very, very smart terminology server. Really nice. Uh, because it's backed by that, see so there's a code system search right here in the value set. So we can actually search Nomad for a code, we'll search for Rabbit. You can see it displays the Snowman metadata for this code. And the coolest thing ever, you can just drag and drop this code into a value set. See? Modeling a fire is super easy. It's as easy as drag and drop. If only everything was as easy as like this. Uh, again, as usual, you, have, you can have all the metadata, just like in the code system, you can fill it in. You can fill in a description for your data set right here. And then in the end, when we're happy, we go to the download value set, we'll download expand value set. It'll expand it, and then it'll give us a JSON file. This JSON file we can publish to a simplifier or anything else. And the canonical URL that we used before, we can plug it into Forge. So this field is my value set. So, what can Snapper do? You can do code systems, you can do value sets, and you can also do concept maps. You can do mapping between codes. And if you have heard of, of this tool before, it used to be previously limited to Australia. It is now worldwide. You can use it anywhere. Which is pretty nice, so thanks to Michael for all the work on that. <laughs> Next, we want to make lots of examples in our regimes, because that is how people learn, and that's how I learn. To make examples, which is to make actual fire instances of resources that conform to our profiles, we can use a tool called FRED, built by the smart IT guys. So look at that. In Fred, when you open it up, it's a web app. You can either give it a existing file to edit, you can either paste JSON in, you can either fetch a resource from a URL, or you can start a new one. Just so always do a blank resource. Let's select a patient. It is fireware, almost every single resource there is. Hit create resource. And now you see it is pretty blank. There's an add element here on top. And you see this is a list of all of the root levels, root level elements that you can have in the patient resource. So to get started, let's select something like the name. So we'll give our patient a name. And you see a similar symbol menu is here in the little drop down. Selected, we want to give the patients, first of all, we give it a code. And you see this fire where it knows all the possible codes we can have, so we just select usual. No chance of making a mistake there. Give a name, just give it a string, so we enter the patient name here. Come Bob. We can give him a family name in the same field. We can also go back to the root element and we can give him a gender. Again, you see it as fire code system where. So I'm just going to select a code from one of the available ones. Pure code. We can also give him a birth date. When we start entering the date, we will notice that it does real time validation of our date. So we 
so we enter it in the correct format as well. Pretty easy to do. Pretty, pretty safe. It's nice to make the nice that you can make any mistakes. And then you can hit the export to JSON and it'll render our resource as JSON. So this is a nice fire schema powered UI for making your fire examples for your IG. Yep, question? I am not sure if it supports validation. I haven't seen that option in it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the question is, can you give it a profile so it will read that profile if, and then give build the appropriate schema and then only offer options from the profile? I haven't seen that option, but given how it loads a condensed version of a fire schema, I think it should be possible. Because all of this data isn't hard coded in, it does load a fire scheme against it. Any other questions about it? Happy to answer questions during the session if you have any. So what you can do? Fred, you can create resources. You can create resources in bundles. It allows you to create a whole bundle of resources right away. It's fire scheme over editing, and then you can export your stuff as JSON at the end. Next, so we've created our profiles, we've created our value sets, we've created our examples. We want to tie it all together into a publication, we want to give it to our vendor saying, here's our stuff, it's implemented. So we can use Simplify for that. It's still great for my company. Working with it is pretty simple, I like it. So, we've got our project, there's a guides tab. The guides tab, there's a new create button. We hit the create button, we give our implementation guide some name, and then we hit the create button here. So here's our new IG, and we have an edit button. When you open up an editor, this is how Simplifier's editor looks like. Over here is your navigation structure. So here you define your navigation tree. So we have a my demo IG is the root, home is the first page that we have in it. There's a little help menu. If you need any help with the markdown syntax, you can just look it up here to see what the simplifier supports. The simplifier supports most of the usual form markdown and also has a custom bunch of custom rendering tags. For example, you see here, double braces, that's a custom markdown tag to render the table of contents. This middle field is our markdown editor, and this field to the right is the preview. So, once we start adding some text in here, we click refresh and we see what our preview refreshes. We can add a new page in the navigation tree. Add in some content in here. And then let's preview our IG. We can actually also paste in the rendering tag. When you, say, when you see render core profile STU, render resource adverse event from a core profiles project. So we can ask it to render any profile, any resource that's on Simplifier in our IG. And here it drops in that rendering view that we've seen before. So how would you essentially work with Simplifier is you create all your resources, you upload them to the project, and then you go into a Markdown Editor, you paste a bunch of rendering tags, and that's how they appear. And of course you create pages, you create all of your guidance, and etc. Cetera, et cetera. Now with that rendering, you can also hit the Preview button. And the Preview button actually takes you to the actual IG. This is, you can't see it right there, but the URL for this is shareable. So your implementation guide is pretty much rendered in real time as you write it. You hit the preview tab and you have your final IG is published at a URL. So you can give it out to anybody else. And of course you can set your IG to be private, so while it is in development, people can't see it. So 
it was very nice in the flag, but the result of the turnaround time is very, very fast in this. And you have real time feedback on your profile. You see, we did this in a couple of minutes, slap together an example, and we see it as anybody else could see it. This is the help text available if you need any guidance or assistance. We have a whole set of different onion views. If you'd like to render your resources XML, you can paste it in an XML rendering tag. And a few other views available are available as well. So, the features of it are you can get started pretty easily. You upload your content, you write the model of markdown. You can style your IG with CSS if you'd like to. You can render your resources instantly with the directives that we've just seen. Of course, you want to validate all your work, what is correct. There's two tools. One is a Windows desktop GUI tool, and the Simplifier platform itself also has the validation feature. So let's look at the top two firstly, see how it works. This is a UI. You can paste in the contents of your resource, be it a profile or an instance. We'll take more of want. This is where the results are, these are where the options are. So, as an example, let's uh, load a fishing resource. This is the content goes here. Click validate, the result is successful. Nice. Now, let's break it, let's delete the mandatory status text, and then it's a failure. Now, if the status is zero, while well, it's supposed to be one to one. So, it's pretty quick to do this job. Uh, if you are working with a lot of profiles, you can put them all into a folder, and when you paste a resource in here that depends upon these profiles, it will validate, they will reveal those profiles and we validate that, that resource against these profiles. So that's a field this quick like export. And you can all, it also supports calling out to terminology servers to do validation if you need to. And this is actually a GUI tool built upon a .NET library. So if you need it in your software, and also embed the same capabilities in it as well. And as an option to regenerate the snapshot, yeah, that's interesting. That is the .NET tool. Then the simplifier platform itself. Go ahead. Yeah, I think so it is. Yeah. Uh, the question was, is the .NET validation library available as NuGet? I believe it is. Yeah. And we can confirm with you out, but I'm pretty sure it would be. Now, Simplifier uses the same library to offer a service online. So if we select a resource in our list, we see that we have a little validate button. We can hit validate, and it will tell us, oh, we failed. We have an issue right here. And if we go back and we select a valid resource from our project list, we validate and close up. The result is successful. So you can also do the same thing online for your uploaded resources, just to make sure that everything is correct. So simplify validate it supports XML for JSON. It supports your custom profiles and. It works in the browser, in the cross platform way. Next, if you would like to interact with a fire server while you're working here, you can use a helpful tool called Postman. I see smiling faces, people are very familiar with it. It was my first, it was my first foray into fire as well, sending like little queries to a fire server, and like, oh, what does this do? Yep, being that. To work with it, you enter your fire base URL here. So here I will work with a test server from R3. 
we can ask it to retrieve our metadata and get the same pattern. The server will wait and it will actually give us back, after a while, it will give us back a bunch of gibberish, a bunch of HTML. Why? Because we didn't fill in the accept field. We didn't say what we wanted back. I'm like, okay, I'm, you can fill in the accept header, you can say I want JSON back with metadata, and then this time around we'll, find, we'll get a proper conformance statement. So accept field, accept header, it's pretty important. We can also retrieve individual resources. So if we would like to retrieve a resource of ID, server ID 1, on the patient, you can do that, patient, send. After we retrieve our source, we can also post information back. Post allows you to create a resource on the server. To do that, you go to a body tab, and you go to a raw tab, and you paste in your fire resource in here. We select what is JSON, so Postman will fill in appropriate headers for us. We change the endpoint to the correct one, we hit send, and the server will require 200 and one, created a new resource successfully. So that is how you can upload stuff to a fire server. And you can also go to the headers tab, and you can see all of the headers tab in the fire server source of quantum telescopes. So here, for example, it gives us a location map for our new resource. That's postman. Uh, what can you do? You can do all the usual things to get post up there doing all the fire spec, which is restful, postman can move a bit. Now you learn to my talk. There are our course of mentions, tools that I don't work with, but are very good out there. There's a folio workbench, it has a file profile editor, and has a VAVSA editor on one, and it has an exporter for the IG publisher. So it can actually create a package for you, which you can feed into the IG publisher. And the IG publisher, which I mentioned in the last talk, it allows you to create a file like IG, because it is actually the same thing, but it is, it's used to create the file specification itself. It is this nice static export that needs to use. Then we also have a Kingfire, which is a Swiss Army knife with various tools. And for validation, it was called Java. There is a Java validator as well for that platform. So, all in all, in making an IG, you can use Forge to make your profile, you use Snap to create your terminology, you can use Fred to make your examples. You can simplify to validate and pull all of your IG together. It is the basic workflow. And I'll be available in the hands-on tutorials session. If anybody has questions about this, I'll be able to help you. So, do you have any questions right now about this? About the tools that I've demonstrated? Yep, I have one question about them now. And there is a microphone coming kind of with Hey, uh, is there any tool to, 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 uh, uh, to generate .NET code based on those profiles? Let's say a code saved uh, will generate a, an enumeration or um, will generate a class with the constraints of a value set. Yeah, I don't think the .NET API supports this. So there might be other generic case tools that you use. Oh, Michelle has the answer to that question. I know that Claude Majot is a contributor of HL7 and he's been working on a code generation library for Fire for the last year, year and a half. And it's pretty there advanced. So check his work. I can hook you up with him. Cool. Any other questions? There's one over here. So if you publish a profile in Simplifier with a workflow of graph, is that considered immutable? Or when does it be considered uh, definitive in the graph? 
track? Uh, it is definitely mutable while it's in draft. There are more final statuses that you can use to specify that it's not mutable. In fact, you'll find that all of the fire profiles and resources that are all still marked as draft, while the fire is not going to take itself. So, that's it. And that was the last question. Time's up. So, thank you everybody for attending.